G'day and welcome to Redriven and welcome to the most overrated 4x4 money can buy. Now that I've pissed many of you off, let me explain. See, a while ago, we reached out to a whole bunch of 4x4 industry experts to vote on one of our top five videos. It was the top five most overrated 4x4s list. And this thing, the 70 series, topped that list. But we wanna know why. They are designed from the outset to last at least 25 years in the most godforsaken environments on Earth. They are considered necessary equipment for the United Nations and countless relief organisations around the world, and their sheer ability in the harshest conditions is without question. So we want to know, like, why the hate? Because, like, these things, they have a huge fan base, but we want to know, now that they're a few years old and have many thousands of kilometres on them, what actually does go wrong with them? What do they like to live with here in the real world on a daily basis? What do they cost to own and operate? And most of all, should you buy one? But first up, what do they like to drive? Firstly, if you don't care how these drive, feel free to skip ahead to about here. Now, when we were researching this video, we noticed that the vast majority of videos online of these things situate a 70 series in some incredible location in the wilderness, you know, pulling some incredible maneuver on the side of a mountain. But let's be honest, the vast majority of 70 series are gonna be spending most of their time in locations like this, the suburbs. Also, like a huge number of 70 series out there, this one is extensively modified, and that doesn't include the rear track correction, which we'll be covering later in the video. But it's super important, if you are on the market for one of these, make sure that any modifications it has, make sure the modifications are of the highest quality and they've been fitted correctly or professionally. Also, just make sure they bloody work. You'd be amazed at how many people buy one of these things and the buttons don't do anything. Check everything works. Now, if you've watched any of our other videos, you'll know that I'm not... I'm not the most masculine of men, you know? Like, I like small pretentious coffees and cycling. And, like, I have been off-roading and I love it and I love camping and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I'd much rather spend my day in an art gallery than going fishing. But I've got to tell you something. This thing, it makes you feel like a man. It makes me feel like I could go and build a pergola and then tear it down again. Now, if you're in the market for a smooth and refined SUV, do not buy one of these. This basically feels like driving a 1980s truck. Many would hate that. Personally, I love it. Like even with this vehicle's aftermarket suspension, which is like really good suspension, it still kind of bobbles and rolls all over the place in the suburbs here. But the actual standard suspension, it's so terrible it feels like it was designed to be replaced in the first place. But you know what, I feel like that's one of the things that makes these so attractive. It, it, you know, it's not trying to pretend it's something it's not, it's just a big tough truck. You know what, I've got mates that I'm sure have bought these purely to make up for the lack of self-esteem, but in their defense, I get it. This, it make, yeah, it makes you feel tough. Now look, the steering is super vague and the turning circle is absolutely bloody horrible, but in saying that, I personally find it pretty easy to judge the parameters of the vehicle. Now, in saying that, I am pretty tall. If you were, I suppose, vertically challenged, it might be really hard to work out where the parameters are. Now, as far as sounds and noises, look, that V8 does sound pretty good. It'd sound even better if it had an aftermarket exhaust on it, but it doesn't sound too bad. But it is a rattly and noisy cabin. This also has a whole bunch of sound deadening, but without the sound deadening, my God, they're loud and noisy. Also, wind noise up here around the, uh, the door jam here, especially at freeway, and freeway speeds, that gets super noisy. But it does have about you know, the aerodynamic coefficiency of a fridge, so some, some wind noise is to be expected. Now also, thanks to the lack of aerodynamics, it does get moved around a bit. Like if you go past a bus or if a truck goes past you on the freeway, it does get kind of buffeted all over the place. And because the steering's really vague, you, you find yourself having to overcorrect for the amount of movement. Again, a lot of people would hate that, I find that like a driving adventure. Now, engine-wise, many people criticize the lack of power and torque from this V8 engine, but it's important to remember that they are heavily detuned from the factory so they can you know, handle the worst quality fuel in the world, but they are quite a tunable engine. As far as this one goes, it feels good. Like, it's got smooth power, it's got a good amount of torque. It's certainly not a quick vehicle, but you're not buying a 70 series to be a sports car. Look, sure, it's honestly a bit of a total nightmare in these conditions, but I feel like it's all those faults that give it so much charm and charisma and personality. It's a bit like, it's a bit like driving a race car every day. It's so stupid, but so much fun. But look, before we dig any deeper on if you should buy one of these, like, what even is a 70 series? Now, the 70 series has been around since 1984, but in this video, we're going to be focusing on the post-2007 V8 models as they are far more prevalent on the used market. But as a quick history lesson, 
Prior to 2007, you can have your 70 series with petrol or diesel engines in short, medium or long wheelbases, and depending on the chassis length and the year availability, as a two-door wagon or van with a hard top or a version with a removable fiberglass roof section, regardless of which 70 series, all have been designed and engineered to be Toyota's more rugged workhorse version of the Land Cruiser, versus the more luxury and consumer-focused 60 through to 300 series cruisers. They were initially targeted at customers like mining companies and farmers more than those desiring a Land Cruiser as something of a fashion accessory. Yet, here we are. Look, yes, plenty of people buy these because of their incredible ability and longevity and reliability and all that sort of stuff. And plenty of other people buy them because of the tax breaks they can get as a business owner. But there are also a whole lot of people buying these as some sort of a fashion accessory. See, the 70 series has unfortunately become sort of the pretend tough blokes Gucci handbag. Like, drive through any affluent suburb here in Australia and you'll see plenty of kitted out 70 series sitting in driveways that have never seen an inch of off-road. But now that I've pissed even more of you off, Look, obviously in this video, we're gonna be covering as much of the 70 series as we possibly can, but we can't go through every specific detail. It would just take forever. So instead, what we have done, we have gathered all of that information and we've put it in our incredibly handy and totally free Redriven Sheet Sheets on redriven.com. Now let's get back inside and see how the interior is after a few years. Look, if you want any forms of luxury or even any sort of interior design that resembles something from this century, this is not your vehicle. But look, in saying that, I do feel like everything going on in here just perfectly suits this vehicle. Like everything just feels tough and rugged, like it's never gonna break. But with such an aging design, there are some pretty horrendous ergonomic issues. For example, when driving, this might just be me, but the seam of my jeans is forced deep into the side of my knee by the power window switches here. Actually, power window switches, this is amazing that these have power, power windows because most of these don't. We'll get to that in a second. But yeah, basically, ergonomics wise, that hurts. Where things are to reach, everything you've got to kind of reach around for. Bit shit with ergonomics. Even actually getting in and out of this can be a challenge. You've got to be quite fit or quite flexible. Now, as mentioned, this particular vehicle is absolutely drenched in aftermarket gear, including this armrest. I don't think these are standard, pretty sure they're not standard. And this makes a hell of a difference. Actually, the 70 series guys that we spoke to, they, they all said you must fit this center console with an armrest. It's good. Even like seating position wise, look, I personally find this pretty comfortable. I've been driving this around for a little while now, now and haven't had an issue, but there are plenty of people complaining about seat comfort. Now, as far as wear and tear goes, look, this isn't this owner's everyday vehicle, but it is their adventure vehicle and they've done a whole bunch of huge trips on it. But because everything feels bulletproof, like it's pretty grotty and dirty in here, but because everything feels bulletproof, the wear and tear is pretty good. Now, as far as practicality up front goes, look, you've got door bins, but they're only really, you know, wide enough for things that have two dimensions. There's a pocket down here for all of life's filth or any of your secrets. This, as I said, has an aftermarket center console, so you've got some storage here. You've got re-driven bottle holders here and here, and even kind of another one that sort of fits down behind the handbrake, which is handy. Now, in this vehicle's defense, it does have an ashtray, which is currently filled with coins, but... Yeah, when this vehicle was designed hundreds of years ago, smoking was thought to be healthy. Now it's thought to be gross and not cool. It also has a decent sized glove box, currently filled with what seems to be most of the owner's belongings. There's another little storage cubby hole here. There's a center console here, again, filled with all of his other belongings. And that's about it for practicality up the front. Nowhere for sunglasses up there. No dedicated spot for your phone if you don't have this center console. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly 7.8 Gucci handbags tall. This is in my driving position. And look, for a big vehicle, it's not great. Like my legs are squished up against the backs of the seats. I've got a heap of actual feet room, but like it's super upright, so it's not real comfy. There's not really anywhere comfortable to put my arms. Yeah, interesting. As far as wear and tear in the back seat goes, look, obviously these are covered in some pretty industrial strength seat covers, so underneath the seats are gonna be in great condition, but you can tell they have been abused a little bit. Also, this aftermarket center console, the vinyl's kind of, and they're coming away at the back there, not exactly Toyota's fault, but all in all, wear and tear for the back seat, yeah, not too bad. And in terms of practicality in the back seat, well, um, well, on the seat covers you've got these, you know, map pockets here, and you've also got a spot for the kids' Lego figures armless um, but that's about it no cup holders not much now in terms of practicality in the back you know how like your parents and teachers used to say there's no such thing as a stupid question here's a stupid question is the back of a 70 series practical a bloody course it is look honestly no matter which 70 series you're looking at they're pretty much a blank canvas for levels of practicality whatever you want to do with the back of one of these you pretty much can 
Well, very much like the driving experience and the levels of accommodation when in standard form, the levels of tech and features, and even safety, are pretty underwhelming. For example, the standard features on, say, a 2015 70 series can include a truly rubbish two-speaker stereo, but it does have Bluetooth connectivity and a CD player. But even on higher spec and later models, the extra features fitted can include a four-speaker stereo, which still sounds rubbish, a digital clock, a remote fuel lid release, and front fog lights. Obviously, you can forget about the likes of Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or really any modern phone connectivity. Actually, you can also forget about, like, electric windows, electric powered mirrors, cruise control, even air conditioning was an optional extra. They do arguably make up for the shortcomings and features and equipment by coming standard with some pretty hardcore off-roading kit, like locking front and rear diffs and a proper low range transfer case. In terms of the safety features and how safe these actually are, prior to 2010, the levels of safety will depend on your levels of faith and self-discipline, but post 2010, I'm gonna explain what these things have, but I'm gonna do it in that like a typical Toyota Land Cruiser TV ad kind of way. Depending on the trim spec and options fitted, from 2010 Toyota introduced driver and passenger airbags, 2012 brought with it anti-lock brakes, 2017 saw traction control, electronic stability control, a hill holder and electronic brake force distribution included, while multiple airbags were fitted from 2021. Now we should mention that Toyota were basically forced to improve the safety features on the 70 series because of their main customers, which is mines and you know, fleet buyers. And even in saying that, the only 70 series to receive a full five-star ANCAP safety rating is the 79 series because that's the main vehicle that those, those customers actually buy. But we have a funny feeling that the only way that one of these got a full five-star ANCAP safety rating was because it absolutely plowed through all of ANCAP safety equipment and didn't even get a scratch. Also, many of the more private 79 series buyers, they do partake in GVM increases to you know, fit these enormous trays and camping bodies on the back. However, as we mentioned, the 2017 models and onwards come with electronic stability control, but it should be noted that that electronic stability control is calibrated for the standard 79 GVM. So be bloody careful because there may be some safety and legality issues on post-2017 models with a GVM increase. Also, how is this for a relatively modern vehicle? In the middle seat in the back, only a lap sash belt. Hmm. But for the full breakdown of what tech, features and safety equipment these things have, again, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. But as you can tell from those safety updates and the fact that in V8 form this thing's been around since 2007, what are those variants and updates? Well, besides the safety updates just mentioned, the major upgrades from 2007 included a revised dash, extra practicality, tech and features, and an enlarged fuel tank from 2013. The 2016-2017 update increased the V8's power and torque thanks to new injectors and engine changes. However, this now Euro 5 compliant engine required a diesel particulate filter or a DPF to be added. Other additions for the 2016-2017 update include other mechanical upgrades to improve the fuel economy and lower noise vibration and harshness levels, while also improving handling and stability. 2021 updated the infotainment system, including a larger screen, but unlike almost every other car on the market, the 70 series still lacks Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and a digital radio. In terms of variants, the vast majority of 70 series will be split across three levels, the base spec Workmate, mid-range GX, and top spec GXL. But what actually goes wrong with the 70 series? Actually, before we get into what goes wrong with these, I've got to give a massive shout out to all of the Land Cruiser and 70 Series owners groups, the 4x4 specialist mechanics and accessory stores, and really anyone that's published a forum or a blog or a report or a survey on the 70 Series, because we've used all of that information to make up this video. Now, in terms of what goes wrong with the exterior, look, most of these do have wind-up windows, but some models that have electric windows, there are reports that the windows can get a bit sticky and resistant. A bit like me. Now, rust isn't a major concern, especially on these older models, but there are some signs of it at the bottom of the windscreen and under the snorkel, if it's fitted with a snorkel, which it probably will be. Also, the doors can fill with water if the drain holes are blocked, but that's only really a problem if you 
partaking in any river crossings. Not to mention that there have been fires in 70 series documented all around Australia due to like dry vegetation getting caught up around that hot DPF housing. But we'll get to more of that in a second. Inside, the cigarette lighters are known to fail due to other electronics piggybacking off it. Also, the handbrake may need adjusting to operate smoothly. But look, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with the 70 series, look, the only way that we can keep making these videos for you is with your support. And the easiest way to support us is simply by hitting those like, subscribe and bell buttons and sharing our content with as many of your mates as you possibly can. That'd be awesome. Now, mechanically, what goes wrong with the 70 series? I'd bloody love to tell you, but I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic. But you know what? Jim is. So if we're going to talk about what goes wrong with these, we have to consider what people are using them for. For example, someone who does extreme off-roading is going to have different problems to someone who's mainly towing a caravan, and they're going to have different problems to ones that are on mine sites or in industrial applications. For example, the off-road guys are going to break drive shafts and things, and the ones who tow, well, they might have transmission or clutch issues. And the industrial ones, well, they might complain about the electrical systems and corrosion. So it's different for all vehicles. And another thing you have to consider, because they're hugely popular, these things are everywhere. So you don't have to look very far at all to, to read about people's absolute horror stories about all the problems they have. Look, the reality is, statistically, these things are actually incredibly reliable. Engine-wise, the early models with the 1HD diesel, those engines are arguably amongst the most reliable engines in that category ever made. If they're well maintained and have a set of injectors every 200,000 Ks, they are virtually unstoppable. The later models with the 1VD V8, which in Australia is all of them since mid-2007, isn't as reliable. And it's not that it's a bad engine, it's just more complicated and there's more to go wrong. I just wanna emphasize that the reliability experience can be vastly different for a lot of different people. And it all depends on what the vehicle's being used for, how it's been looked after, and what type of modifications it's had. Some of the more common problems we see are fuel system related. At the cheaper end, you've got things like pressure sensors and suction control valves. And up the more expensive end, you've got things like high pressure pumps and injectors. The high pressure pumps and the injectors will last much longer just by more frequent fuel filter changes. You don't have to lash out and get an expensive aftermarket pre-filter. Just change a fuel filter more often. Do it every 10,000 Ks. You know, it might seem excessive, but it is way cheaper than a fuel system overhaul that can cost you five to $10,000. The inlet systems and the EGR valves can clog up terribly, and we recommend, like a lot of late model diesels, put a catch can on it. However, putting a catch can on it will affect your new car warranty, so keep that in mind. The whole catch can versus new car warranty is a part of a much bigger conversation, which we will have at a later date. Now for the older or higher mileage ones, if you are having any fuel system or inlet system jobs done, you might want to lash out and spend an extra five or 600 bucks and get a new starter motor while you're in there because that in the V8 is right down in the V under all the inlet and injector systems. So while you've got it apart, put a starter motor on it. Another big ticket item that can fail is the turbocharger. On these things, there is only one, uh, which is different to the 200 series. They have two turbos. If it should fail, and typically it will only fail if it's been neglected or poorly maintained, or if there's a dodgy tune, that doesn't help either. But if it fails, it can be like a four or $5,000 round trip. Although they are a pretty tough engine, shitty mods, poor tunes or neglect can all lead to worst case scenario of a blown up engine. And if that should happen, you can be looking at a repair bill over 20,000 bucks. So it definitely pays to look after them. As far as the drive lines go, the clutch in these is definitely a weak point. If you're towing or carrying heavy loads or doing some hardcore off-roading, you should definitely upgrade that before it fails. There are plenty of options out there in terms of heavy, heavy duty clutches. And you can have something pretty decent in there between two and a half and 3,000 bucks. The gearbox itself does have a few problems. And again, it typically fails when it's being really pushed to its limits but uh, it's highly recommended to change the oil more frequently. Now the factory recommends every 40,000 Ks or 20,000 Ks for extreme use, but we would just say 20,000 Ks no matter what. Um, part of the problem is uh, fifth gear just completely shears off and it's highly recommended that you don't actually use fifth gear when you're towing. The other driveline elephant in the room is the difference in wheel track between the front axle and the back axle. Now this exists because the front was widened to accommodate the V8 and they never really got around to widening the rear to match. Now, this can cause a few problems. It can cause handling problems. And in sand, there are reports of premature wheel bearing failure, not to mention it just looks weird. There are a few price points to fix this. The cheaper end, you've, you can run two different offsets of rim. 
problem there is you need to carry two spare tyres to, if you, in case you need a spare, and, or the more expensive one of a whole new rear diff housing, which is wider. Now that can cost in excess of 10,000 bucks. Look, I know it all sounds like doom and gloom, but the perfect all-rounder daily driver, four-wheel drive, tow slash work rig doesn't exist. The reality is if these things have been looked after and well serviced, they are incredibly reliable. The problems start with shitty modifications and abuse, but what do they cost to buy if you should buy one at all? Well, this is where so many people struggle with the 70 series, what they cost. See, even when brand new, since 2007, and depending on which spec or you know, type of 70 series you're looking at, the prices have ranged from $55 to $85,000 here in Australia. Now, that's a hell of a lot of money for what is a very basic truck. Currently here in Australia, and talking the post-2007 V8 examples, when talking like the worst condition ones, like really shit ones with over 400,000 Ks, you're gonna be looking at over $30,000. In saying that, you can get pre-2007 ones with you know, God knows how many Ks and really only in project car kind of state for around $8,000, but that's a hell of a commitment. But at the other end of the spectrum, see up there, that's the sky. That's about the limit because currently here in Australia, some 70 series are asking more than $240,000. That's a quarter of a million dollars for a 70 series Land Cruiser. Actually, it's kind of something like this. Now look, we're not going to pass judgment on if those prices are actually worth it because we want to know what do you think? Are these worth a quarter of a million dollars? Let us know in the comments. But look, buying them is one thing. What do they cost to own and operate? Now in terms of fuel consumption, Toyota claims a figure of anywhere from 10.7 to 11.9 litres per 100 k's. But you got to remember that is based on a completely standard 70 series with not like three tonnes of aftermarket accessories bolted to it. But when it comes to modified 70 series, which let's be honest, most of them are, we're seeing figures of anywhere from 13 to 15 litres per 100 k's, all the way through to 23 litres per 100 k's. But let's be honest, if you're willing to drop a quarter of a million dollars on a 70 series, the cost of fuel shouldn't be a concern. But after all of that, should you buy one? Look, this isn't one of those no, you shouldn't buy one because it might blow up and cost you a fortune to fix because these have proven their reliability and longevity for nearly 40 years. But the 70 series is a hugely compromised vehicle. For what they cost in standard form, they ask a near insane amount of money for the absolute bare minimum when it comes to equipment, features, creature comforts, driving dynamics, and safety tech. And even though they do offer an incredible base on which to build your ultimate off-roading, towing, or touring machine, it's important to ask yourself if you're willing to pay so much money to put up with the long list of negatives to justify the few and specific positives. Look, we see nothing wrong with spending a fortune on your hobby, and there is something incredibly satisfying about building something like this. But just don't try to convince anyone that these in standard trim are the best four-wheel drives ever made. So should you buy one? Look, if you're a tradie or a farmer or a business owner and you can buy one of these as a tax break, plus also take it away on weekends to go adventuring, yeah, absolutely you should buy one. Secondly, if you're the sort of person that genuinely requires the very specific set of skills that these things offer and you are genuinely going to use those skills and you can afford one, yeah, absolutely buy one. But if you have no real intention of ever heading deep into the wilderness and you're only buying a 70 series to live out some sort of tough guy fantasy that you have about yourself or you just must have the latest masculine fashion accessory to compensate for a lack of self-esteem, yeah, 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 sure, go and buy one. But just know that you're, you're ruining the 70 series image for all of the worthy owners out there. What actually goes wrong with them? What do they like to drive and deal with in a f**k me? Here we go, this is the one, man. Look, the only way that we can keep making... Sorry, my f**king moustache is killing me. Okay, here we go. Let us know in the comments below. And remember... Now, if not one of these, what else do you buy? Like, maybe like a super modified 200 series or maybe a patrol, or if you've got heaps of cash, maybe a G-Wagon. But honestly, this is about the only thing that can do what this thing can do. But would you actually buy one or do you already own one? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, can you please hit those like, subscribe and bell buttons and share our stuff as much as you can? That'd be awesome. See you next time.